Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Jan Mundo. So Jan is a headache coach. She's the developer of the Mundo Method, which is a hands-on method for working with headaches. Um, she's also trained as a somatic coach and a bunch of other stuff. So she was at the Embodiment Conference and was well-received there. Jan, welcome. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be talking to you and your listeners. So what was your journey into this? Because I understand it was like 1970, so nine years before I was born, Jan. <laughs> Yeah, tell me I'm old, huh? <laughs> I am. I've been on a journey. Um, in 1970, I heard of a claim that you could stop a headache or migraine with your hands if you put your hands on the front and back of the head. And so I started playing with that on myself and others. I, I didn't really have migraines. You know, I would get occasional headaches, but I was living a pretty natural lifestyle. Um, I had moved to the country. I was a founding member of America's largest commune called the farm and we worked really hard and we lived a natural lifestyle you know ate and grew, grew all our food put it up and um, so we had a good diet we were enjoying life in the country not a lot of stress so I didn't get a lot of them however I will say my mom used to have them when I was a kid which is common in people who have headaches or migraines uh -huh. um, especially with migraines there's a familial like a genetic component and so she had them. And I used to, when I was a kid, um, I would rub out what she called the knots and spurs on her neck and shoulders. And it seemed to help her. But she, you know, she would have to, like a lot of migraine sufferers, you lie down in a darkened room. Um, you can't talk. Any slightest movement makes you want to vomit. <laughs> um, a lot of people take heavy medications, um, which yeah. can cause rebound headache, make the headaches come more often. Yeah. And um, more strongly. So um, I was around it, but I wasn't, I hadn't really suffered with them yet. And I think most people that just have the odd little, you know, like maybe I get dehydrated or I stare at a computer, I get a bit of a headache, I take a price while it goes away. This is totally different from like my sister. She might be like two, three hours in the dark, not being able to do anything, not being at a mum, not being at work. You know, that's serious. That's a, like a debilitating thing. Yes. Yes. And, um, that's, um, it's good to know that your sister has them in that, you know, then you understand, you know, not that she has them, not that it's good that she has them, but it's, no, you understand like what it can be yeah. like. Yeah. Right. And that's, um, uh, there is, um, a lot of communication in the headache community, especially since now on online, there are large communities of people with headaches and migraines who talk amongst themselves. The headache and community, even that term kind of surprises me. I know, migraine community. Some of them are sprung up around um, organizations. Some of them are sprung up around um, uh, pharmaceutical companies who have these websites, and so people talk. And um, in a way, it's how I'm different um, because um, they say that you can't ever get over them and they want more drugs and more research. But my, my work is really different than that. However, one of the things that they go through um, is really important for people to understand, which is that, like you said, somebody will say, oh, just they'll think they're faking it, basically, or um, malingering, or that they just want to go home early from work, or that they want to withdraw from social and family activities on purpose. So that's not really true. I mean, they're really suffering. And some of the things, one of the things I mentioned is nausea. You can get, um, like you're saying about your sister lying down in a dark room. Um, I mean, this can go on for a few days with people too. And some people will say, and this can happen with, um, especially when people get in a a cycle of too many medications, then um, the headaches can go on for weeks and years. Um, but some of the other symptoms are feeling, um, you know, off balance, very sensitive to touch. Like some people say their hair hurts, um, very sensitive to um, sound and light and odors. Like everything seems magnified mm. and the littlest movement makes it all worse. And a lot of people vomit. And then there are other 
conditions that go along with it um, because of feeling so disabled and a lot of times misunderstood, yeah. or sometimes it's a precursor to it. There's depression. There are other what they call comorbidities. Yes. I once took three grams of high quality amphetamine and then drank 18 pints of beer, which you couldn't oh, do if you were on the amphetamines. And then next- live to tell the tale. Just the next day, my hangover sounds a lot like what you're describing. I mean, it hurt to even move, you know, like it hurt to talk like like this is when you're in that state. Now, mine was self-induced. Right. But when you're in that state, like that's that's, again, not a small thing. Right. So I think this is a good starting place to build some understanding as to how unpleasant these things can be. Absolutely. And I do point people to their worst hangover if they've never had a migraine. (laughs) So, you know, somebody for somebody to really understand it, if they're an adult, hopefully. Yes. Um, You know, or a bad flu or a bad virus where you have all those, you know, your head is going to explode and all that. That's that's migraine. You know, those are the symptoms of migraine. What you experienced was like having a, a bad migraine, except for it goes on in cycles for, you know, years and decades often at a time for people yes i had a period when i was setting up my business 10 years ago very intense stress and very intense work and personal growth and i would have vision distortions and for about half an hour it would go sort of shimmery like rainbowy around the outside and then blurry and then my vision would eventually go and i just have to sit down in the dark for half an hour and come back and my sister said that's like one of the things she gets but I didn't have any pain, so it wasn't really a big problem, except if I had something to do. And I only had it for like a month under this extreme stress. And, you know, so these other symptoms aren't there other than just the headache, which like the vision distortions and things like that, which may be a little unusual for people. Right. So fewer people get those, but they're a thing. They're a phenomenon. And in his book from the mid 80s, I believe, Oliver Sacks talks about it, his book, Migraine. And he, I'm just going to turn off this thing. Sorry. I'm going to be making noise otherwise. Okay. So um, Oliver Sacks talks about um, scintillating scotoma, which is what it sounds like you had. Okay. It's like ephemeral. Pretty true. And then sometimes the, um, your peripheral vision is blocked off. Yes. Um, and it looks like you're looking down a tunnel. Like some people get those. I only had them one time. And yeah. it wasn't that long ago, like within the past couple of years. I'm like, oh, that's what that is. is that, so I don't usually, yeah, I get totally- migraine if I, if I don't do, follow my own advice but that I give everybody else, but um, I don't get those. But that, yeah. And so that's also called the migraine equivalent. Like you get everything else but the migraine. Right. Okay. And I went to the doctor because I was pretty scared by this, you know. It happened a few times. And I went, this is worrying, you know, because I thought it was a vision problem, whatever. And the doctor just didn't do any tests or anything. He just said, oh, you've got some weird kind of migraine. You'll get over it. Try not to be stressed. And it just seemed like migraine was this kind of bucket category for anything kind of like <laughs> severe, like in this area, anything above the nose that went wrong. And I just was kind of unsatisfied and luckily it cleared up and, you know, my life got less stressful. But, um, yeah, I, I kind of, that gave me some sympathy for sure. Cause it, you know, I remember one time I was cycling and it happened and I had to try and get home You know, I had to get a taxi. So, um, okay. So, yeah. So it sounds like you actually do have them or you do have or had migraine equivalent. And so I think of it a lot of times, like uh, some people are, tend to say get bronchitis more than others right some people tend to get um, upper respiratory things some people get tend to get stomach stuff some people tend to get migraines and so it sounds like it does run in your family if you don't take care of yourself in the ways that you need to yeah and you know my sister and i have pretty different lifestyles in many ways as well like i'm doing yoga and meditation and martial arts and she's not you know so that, that could be a factor but i don't want to you know put any blame there but um okay so well, also, let me just say one more thing. They're more common in women, like okay. two thirds to three quarters of two, about half to two thirds of migraine sufferers are women because of their hormones. Do so you think it's hormonal? So if I was to put well, my... there is research that shows that. Yeah. Okay, so like if you have high, high estrogen levels or stuff, it's like more likely to happen, or what's what's the hormonal? Well, there's a great book um, uh, by Susan Hutchinson, uh, Doctor Susan Hutchinson, and she goes into it about women and migraine. Um, but um, it's, it's, uh, some of it has to do with the estrogen drop. 
Okay. So, or changes in estrogen levels, which happens before a woman starts a period. It happens around ovulation. It happens um, after giving birth. Um, it happens during perimenopause. That's why a lot of women, that's what happened with me, start getting migraines during per- perimenopause, even though maybe they would have had them before Sorry, they really perimenopause. start getting them worse. What's, what's the peri bit? I know it menopause. The peri bit is when you first start having symptoms, and then menopause is when you when you are not getting your periods. But okay. before is all these other symptoms where your hormones, so your cycles might be irregular, um, your hormones all over the place. You're you might be getting hot flashes, night sweats, um, wake up in puddles of perspiration <laughs> that's happened to me um just all of a sudden like wherever you are in the daytime you you're someplace and all of a sudden you feel like you have to throw off all your clothes because um you're actually starting to sweat just like in the middle of whatever yeah okay i mean you're just dripping like you just ran a race so why did you choose this area though jan like why i mean you know there's lots of areas lots of niches we can work in what was it particularly about this area that you thought you wanted to work in so for me, it was my path has been of putting one foot in front of the other, basically. So I heard about this therapy, and after I um, learned that you or started experimenting with it, I seemed to become a magnet for people who had migraines, so where or headaches. So wherever I was, if I was um, at a party, a family gathering, going to visit somebody, shopping. At, at the Gap, uh, at a department store, makeup counter. I mean, these are all <laughs> spinning them up, but these all things, they all happen. Like people would come up to me or they would just walk by me and say, oh my God, I've got such a headache. Or they would say directly to me. And they didn't know that I'd been experimenting with this, kind of doing my own little tests. And uh, so I'd pop up and say, well, I can help you. And so I would stop i would take them aside into a corner of a room or into a dressing room of the gap i'm going just give me five minutes all i'm going to do is put my hands on your head so i would and uh, what i found was i could stop their headache in about five minutes um if it was a bad migraine which i didn't really know at the time the difference between headaches or migraines it might take a little longer but their pain would go away and not only would their pain go away, which is one of the most fascinating things to me, all the other symptoms would reverse. So say if you had those visual symptoms or felt nauseated or um, you were light sensitive, sound sensitive, um, all of those things would reverse as well. So it was doing something to the brain. I wasn't thinking about that at the time. All I was each time was I was curious to see if it would work. And each time it seemed to work. And I also was experimenting on myself. And I had a a boss in the mid 80s who had them um, every day. And so I would work on her. Uh, It's just like kind of put itself in, headaches put themselves in front of me, you could say. And I got really curious about it Mm. because I'm like, well, so I started reading about it. And then I had, I was a, after I left the, community I'd been living in, the commune. <laughs> I was um, I had moved back to LA where I was raised. I uh, had worked my way up and was working at um, TBS, CNN, um, when it was a brand new network. And um, I got laid off. I'd done, you know, I was making the best money. <laughs> I got, I, I um, or no, actually I'd moved, I had moved on from there and I was working in uh, advertising magazine publishing and I got laid off from there. And I'm like, what am I going to do? So um, I decided to do uh, that. I would teach people how to stop their own headaches and migraines. And so I realized two things that number one, I had no idea what I'd been doing on the head. Number two, I didn't know anything about headaches and migraines. So I started studying about both. I became a certified massage therapist. And then little by little, things would be coming up in my path as well. So I got referred my first patients from a neurologist at UCLA Medical Center. And she said, you know, um, you were able to help people stop their headaches, but the headaches would still come back, which I knew. I knew I was doing a relief method, not preventative. So I started working on the preventative part and put together a program based on what it helped me when I was going through back to perimenopause, where I was um, found that I would get these horrible migraines the day before my period. However, if I was eating better, kind of 
what you noticed in reverse, how you got them. If I was eating better, if I was exercising, if I was um, meditating, if I was under less stress, kind of doing everything right and everything was in balance, I wouldn't get them. So I put that together in a program. And then I started training in somatics because when I had people on my massage table or talking about the history of their headaches, um, everybody had a story and that led back to their body and that led back to their, their emotional content would come up during session, whether it was um, opening certain parts of their body through touch and just be, them becoming aware of it, or whether it was telling the story of when they first got migraines. And then the other part of the story is that when I started training in somatics, my back that had been locked up for like 15 years, I had this emotional epiphany where my thoughts, emotions, memories, and release of my physical body and extreme emotional, like a lot of sobbing came together at once and my back released. And I realized that the cells, our cells are holograms. And so everything lives in there together. You know, we're a lot of energy and we're a lot of um, everything. We're not just our flesh and blood. So I started studying more and more with somatics and mind-body connection and how that relates to people's pain and how they hold themselves and how their history and their mm, shaping and structure affects their body and their health and their, their whole being. Okay, so how do we do this? Maybe someone has uh, <coughs> found this podcast. I mean, there's obviously the preventative lifestyle stuff. We'll come back to that. But what about this, the curative or the um, alleviating kind of hands-on techniques? Like, is that something you can talk people through who are listening? I mean, they won't be able to see the video, but like, is that something you can talk people through or give people a few pointers? Mm, interesting. Um, well, there are a couple of things. So when I teach people, it's about building up their skills over time. And so some of it is becoming aware of where their pain is and how to, how to refine their touch and then how to bring their mind to their pain and then how to release the pain. So there are a lot of different layers and parts to it. One of the things that I could we could do is that would be the easiest to do would be to do a little shoulder and neck release, which isn't working directly on the head. Okay. But a lot of times the components that are holding the migraine in or keeping it in place mm -hmm. are this unrecognized, unregarded stress and tension because we don't really realize we're doing it yeah. and as much as I know I still have it you know and as much as I've practiced I still have it so it's a, a, about kind of one hand leading the other so we, we won't do the full-on stopping a migraine in progress because that's a little you know it, it, it yeah. takes time to build that up but we could do some shoulder and neck release maybe a little bit of head massage and I, I think I can walk people through that okay let's do it I want to give that a go okay I love <laughs> All right, so we're seeing each other. So is that fair? <laughs> no, you've got to you've got to talk me through it. Like, tell you what, I'm going to turn my camera off, and then that way you you won't be able to use visual cues. Actually, I would like to see you. <laughs> turn it back on. Better. This is way better for the. For the, for the <laughs> I mean, I know how to do it, but I would like to see you know so that I can actually. It will bring up uh, pointers for me or things I don't have to name you, but it'll help me. Yeah, but okay. Just to okay. be able to key you in or key anybody in. But I, I could easily do it. Go for it. All right. Well, heck, I'll say it. I wrote a book, so um, the Headache Healer's Handbook, and that is a one-way communication. So I'm teaching people how to do it without seeing them. So I know I can do it, but I would like to see you. So the first thing is when we do body work, you want to have good alignment. And we spend most of our time in a chair, vertically mm -hmm. driving, sitting at our desk, whatever. So it's good to get those principles. Because if you're not aligned and your head is forward, which most of us live in that as well these days, right? Leaning into our computer, yeah, and um, bent neck texting. <laughs> so bent down, looking down at our phones or our devices or reading. So everything's kind of bent down. And if the head is forward, then we're engaging the shoulder muscles. So if your head is forward and you're trying to work on your shoulders, then it's counterproductive because you're trying to release and relax the very muscles and tension that you're tightening at the same time because your head is forward. Kind of like carrying a bowling ball out in front of you. So your head's like a bowling ball and you're using all these neck and shoulder muscles in the back of your lower skull muscles to 
to um, extend in that way. So the first thing we do is start with align your posture. So an easy thing to do is start with your feet and have your feet about hip distance apart and have them perpendicular to the floor. Mm -hmm. So they're not like scooted up against you. Yes. So you're not yeah. on your toes. A lot of people do that. And I find, you know, it's like you have to form a loop between what you're doing and how you're living your body. Because sure enough, your body will go back to what you're doing. So it's always being engaged in what you're doing and seeing what your body's doing when you're doing that and then coming back to the principles, right? So um, perpendicular legs to the floor, then thighs parallel. And then instead of having a, if you're going to have a pillow, um, don't have it in back of your upper back, have it below your waist. So you're supporting your sacrum and um, so that you can sit vertically. So you want to just touch lightly your, the side of your ear, the side of your shoulder and the side of your hip, and then draw a line down between them and see if it's vertical. See if your head is on the diagonal forward. And if it is, then bring your head back over your shoulder. And when I say back, yeah, just slide it back like a, like a glider rocker so that your chin doesn't go up because people tend to do that too. They'll tip their chin up to bring their head back. And then sometimes when our shoulders are so stuck <laughs> that we're just tight all the time, it's difficult for people to even bring their shoulders, their head back over their shoulders. So that's the first thing you want to do. All right. Then the two principles that I use are very technical terms, puppy dog paws. And so where you just bend your arms up at the elbows and then flop your paws over. <laughs> and sometimes they make little whimpering noises like a begging puppy so that they're soft. Because if you have claw hands, like make your hands into a claw and try and um, – Put, put one on the back of the other and latch on and then try and do little circles if your hand is tight. You can't get in there. And then if you just rub your hand, one hand over the other, uh, over the back of your hand, that's not getting in too deeply either. But if you latch on, those are the little frog pads. That's the second principle. So if you latch on to the skin and then just move the skin to the tissue underneath, that's the kind of touch we want to have or latching on because you can get in much more deeply that way. Okay, so those are the two principles. So you always want to come back to your little puppy dog paws and little frog pads. So then we're going to work on, let's all start in the same shoulder. Start with your right hand. Let's work on the left shoulder. So bring your hand over and in, in your arm in front of your chest so that your, your, your elbow can just drop down. And then you want to grab between the heel of your hand and your fingers. So not the finger tippy tips, but what I call the flats. So just stretch your fingers out a little bit. So the, the heel of your hand, you don't use your thumb really when you're working on yourself. So the heel of your hand will be in the front of the shoulder ridge and the, your fingertips and your finger flats of your fingers and finger pads will be in the back. And then just squeeze your palm and fingers together and then slightly pull up, grab and pull up toward the ceiling. So it might help to go under your shirt you can get a better grip that way. Sometimes it's easier to get a better grip on top of your clothes, whatever works. So in this case, I'm going under my sweater. And then, so squeeze, pull up, and then just take some deep breaths into your belly. So you want to feel the tissue begin to soften. Maybe it warms a little, maybe has a little burning feeling. What are you noticing? So I'm finding hard to sort of grab and hold it up there, but I mean, it's pleasant. I massage myself every day in the bath, so it's a pleasant thing. Oh, that's good, yeah. So sometimes it is. So have your thumb next to, um, next to your fingers. Mm -hmm. So yes, like that. And then grab like that. And in some cases, it might help to hold your elbow. Um, sometimes when the shoulder is, there's a lot of muscular buildup, sometimes it is hard to grab. So now do that same move, but squeeze and release. And see if you can go, you can go a little closer towards your neck, you can go out toward the shoulder. So we're first working generally, so warming and then very technical term, swishing the tissue. So squeeze and release and see if you can soften it up a little more. So sometimes it is hard to grab and it just takes a little bit to get in there. 
and everybody's different. So see if it feels, does it feel a little softer or warmer? It's like clay. Yeah, I mean, I find consistently just touching the body helps and then a little pressure and massage. I mean, it's pleasant. Right. So you want to make contact with, if you feel any tightness, did you find any spots that feel like they're a little There's tender? No bad knots, but I mean, the trapezius is still a little tight, yeah. Okay, so then just let your fingers, use your fingers like a tool. So first, second, third finger, if you want, your pinky, or just first, second, third is good. And just use them like a tool and latch onto the surface of the skin. And then see if you can make contact with that tightness by pressing a little deeper, but doing little circles. And then still breathing. And that area of the levator scapula, that point at the top of the shoulder blades near the spine, that can be tight for a lot of people because it's where your shoulder blade and your neck attach. You know it is for me. And so just see if you can loosen that up a little bit. And then does it feel like your arm's getting a little tired? Yeah, my hands have been tired, yeah. Yeah. So then you always want to get rid of what you've collected. So, and then watch for the furniture. So I have a specific way I do it. So bend your arm up. So bend your elbow and have your fingers near the front of your shoulder, just soft. And then uh, again, watch for furniture. Flick your arm straight, almost in a uh, spiraling movement down to, down to, toward the floor kind of diagonally down toward the floor. So you're not holding your arm up to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's down and keep shaking it until it feels like you've, and really extend your fingers and extend your arm and put your mind into getting out, out, out until your arm is no longer tired. Okay. So then just let that arm, both arms rest in your lap. And then see if you're noticing a difference between your left and right side. Do you feel any different? Yeah, I mean, the, it's more pleasant on one side. Uh -huh. And when you say pleasant, what, do you, how does that, what are the sensations of it being more pleasant or it being tighter? A bit, bit warmer, a bit more relaxed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. And so um, I hate to leave people uneven, so let's do the other side really. Um, so reaching across with your left hand and arm, with your arm resting on your chest, and then just squeeze your heel of your hand and fingers together and squeeze them and then pull them up. You might notice one side feels tighter than another. And then breathe. And then move out a little bit toward the side of your shoulder. And with each squeeze, you can do a little breath. And then coming back toward your neck. So you might notice that you feel tighter. Some people might feel tighter on the ridge of their shoulders. Some might feel tighter toward their back, um, on the ridge of the, levator, of the scapula, which is the shoulder blade. And then do the squeeze and release. So it's good to notice. And then some people might find they're tighter on one side than another. Squeeze, release, squeeze, release, and then see if you can zero in on what might have felt tight on when you're doing the squeeze and release. So you're using the general loosening and warming to inform where there are areas that might need more work. And so then latch on with your little frog pads and then see if you can make contact with the pain and then rub in little circles there, making contact to reach and loosen and soften the tissue underneath. And then go check out your hand and arm. So that's one way to start. Okay, so you're finding people loosen up some of the kind of muscular tensions around the neck and shoulders that's helping a lot with headaches. Yeah, it's well, I look at headaches and migraines, especially as a combination of factors. So the tightness that people have is definitely one part of that. And the you know, breathing high in the chest is another trigger. Okay. The foods that people eat, um, sometimes the fumes that they're around, you know, for some people, even perfumes. 
Um, or say if they're an oil painter for some, I had one client that used oils and she switched to acrylics and got much better. For some people, the weather in their particular area or certain mm-hmm. kinds of weather, low barometric pressure or changes in weather. So there are all different triggers. And for some people, there are things that are more dominant than others. But for a lot of people, it's combinations of factors and bodily tension, shoulders, neck, head and face and chest are definitely upper body or definitely part of that combination for a lot of people. And you describe also different exercises like scalp massage type things or what, what are the other sort of parts of this? I know we can't demonstrate it all now, but as I'm just curious. Yeah, so there's the routine for the shoulders. Then um, there are there's routine for the back of the neck and also for the sides of the neck. So a lot of times when people say their headaches start from their neck, they don't realize how tight the side of their neck is. So starting from the back of your ear, um, it's called the SCM, sternocleidomastoid, and it attaches, if you, you can feel it if you put your fingers, make a little channel and just lightly, lightly draw down to the front of your neck. There's this muscle on the side of your neck. It, it goes on the diagonal from the back of your yeah. ear, and you just touch it really lightly, and you can feel it jut out. So that muscle, a lot of times, is tight, and people don't realize that. So we work on that. And then scalp massage, again, you latch on and do it. I do everything really methodically so that everything gets covered. All the areas get touched. And there are certain strokes for for everything that loosen that in a way that makes it, that works counter to the tightening that people get when they get tension headaches or migraines. So I didn't describe tension headaches. We described migraines and the, the pulsing, pounding, and you know, lying down, all those other symptoms. But um, tension headaches, I might as well, you know, they deserve a mention, which is that you get this vice grip, tight hat band like tension that goes around your head. It's like a seizing up. And a lot of times that also involves the neck and the shoulders or what I call tight face. Like, you know, we have social face and when your face gets tired, (laughs) you're um, kind of having to prop it up. If you're like a service job, you're always having to, you know, hello, you know, be on. So, and service jobs are, you know, that could be any kind of profession where we interact with people. So those are other ways that we can collect tightness and not realize it. So we work on those, but that's like the physical part, but it's also when you do it effectively, it's about bringing your mind into where you're tight and feeling it and then learning how you collect it and then learning how to see when and in what situations you collect it and then seeing how to not collect it. It's like that poem about walking down the street and falling into a hole. Yes. Nice, nice practice poem, that one. Yeah. So you have bringing mindfulness to it so people can start to see how they're, you know, very Alexander technique, really, like how they're, they're using themselves on a daily basis. Exactly. Uh-huh. And, and the lifestyle stuff, you said this kind of lifestyle stuff, like what are you recommending for people who listen to this? You have headaches and migraines and, you know, well, what can they do lifestyle-wise? Well, one of the really great things is to keep a headache diary. So when you, if you've gone to a neurologist or to a doctor, you might have gotten a list of triggers. So the list of triggers that I have and use is a pretty big list. But that doesn't mean that you have to cut everything out of your life. It's really about looking at all the factors in your life and seeing which of them might be contributing. And one really great way to keep track of that is to keep a headache diary. So that doesn't mean just to keep a diary of when you get headaches and when you take medications. I like to look at it like you're looking at your whole entire day and you're keeping a track of everything that happened from the time you wake up to what and when you eat and drink to the interactions that you had that have been significant, like you had a stressful meeting or a stressful interaction with someone. So what happened to you? What happened in your body after that? So just to note those things and then start to become aware of them and start to look at the cause and effect day after day or week after week. 
And so keeping a diary in that way where you're just noticing and then also adding practices on. So we work with meditation, breathing, breathing lower in the body and a whole host of triggers, but looking at combinations. So I call it the Chinese menu theory. So you might have had peanut butter last Tuesday and then you had it again this Tuesday and maybe it didn't affect you. But maybe next Tuesday you had peanut butter and you got a migraine. I'm just using that as an example. It's not necessarily a trigger for people, but for some people it is, or dairy, say. But then that day when you got it, you also were under a lot of stress. You had deadlines. You had to do a bunch of stuff with the kids. And so it's noticing what you're doing and how you live in your body when you're doing it. So you're tracking, I mean, this is this, a great principle for anything I've found. You're tracking the lifestyle factors and you're noticing which ones make the, whatever the problem is worse. Yes. And which ones make it better. Yeah. I knew someone that had cancer that did this. They tracked everything and they, there's certain things that were really helping there. It was like they were tracking, I think their T cells or something like this was the main measure. And, um, and they were just tracking, they call it quantified self movement. And they were really tracking everything in their life and starting to look at how they impacted things. I, I think in the future, you know, we'll come and we'll give our doctor our, our watches with all, got all the information on, you know, like the Fitbits. And the doctor will plug it in the computer and go, oh, okay, it seems like this is the problem, you know? Like, that's, I think that's going to be quite an interesting way of doing it. Unfortunately, the technology and capture there isn't yet, so we have to be a bit more somatic about it, I think, for now. Right. Well, I think, you know, really somatic, though, that's the first cause. That's the origin of everything. So why put a machine in the middle if we can learn how to do it ourselves? It's not the origin of everything. I mean, let's say you, you're breathing in, you know, you're a painter that's breathing in a fume, you know, and, and they're, they're realizing that, oh, my God, I actually always get this after I've been using oil paints, but not when I've been using the other kind of paints or whatever. Right. Well, that's what, yeah. I mean, that's what we were just talking about. But what I'm saying is that, we can learn how to do that without the machine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I find most people aren't very good at looking at patterns of data over time, frankly. Uh, okay. Well, uh, they haven't been to me. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what my work is really about. It's how, how to teach people. It's teaching people how and coaching them into, okay, well, what was different about this? What was the same about this? So that they can become basically empowered to control their own destiny why not yeah for sure so give, give us some more examples of how you're helping people kind of tune in then to you know what, what what's helpful and what's not mm. meditation helps a lot with that because you're really paying attention moment by moment so you're building that muscle of paying attention so that's one thing breathing also helps with that because it's helping you slow down and really become aware of what's our birthright? If we weren't breathing, we won't be alive, right? So it really is becoming present to everything. So building our skills of being present to our own bodies and then centering practices that help people become aware of what happens to them moment by moment, not just when they're sitting on the mat and sitting mm -hmm. on the cushion, mm -hmm. when they're actually in the day-to-day -day world and in interactions. And that's where a lot of the somatic part comes in. So we all have habits but then what's underneath the habits what makes us react or act in a certain situation it's largely shaped from when we're very young from moment one how we're touched how we're talked to how we're seen how people talk to each other who are around us how they react to things and react to their health and so it's really unpacking and unwinding all of that that goes underneath how people um act or think or feel like what shaped that yes just for listeners the word somatic uh, was coined by thomas hannah and i'm guess who um supervised richard strozzi heckler's phd and i'm guessing you've got that word through him and it's it can be used as a specific form of um body work called somatics uh, though I, I believe you're using it more like a synonym with embodiment so big topic yes everything you said uh, as far as thomas hannah and richard strozzi heckler and the word being derived from the Thomas Hanna coin from soma, the Greek word soma for body, which is mind, body, emotion, spirit. So the whole person. So I use it like that and also look at it. I mean, there's a whole 
lineage of somatics, starting mostly attributed to Wilhelm Reich, who saw that people could change. But they don't call it, I'm gonna, Jen, I'm going to interrupt because you're going to confuse listeners. They don't call it somatics. The only people who call it somatics are Thomas Hanna's group and people coming out of Strozzi. Like that isn't a, that isn't a word used in body psychotherapy, for example. Like the word a somatic approach, but the idea of somatics as a thing, that's, that's just inaccurate. Okay, well, I, what I've been trained in is there, well, there's a whole somatic lineage. So um, I'm, I'm not sure about saying somatics or somatic, but, uh-huh. but, but the lineage that involves, um, so they might not use that term, but the lineage yes, that involves- that's what I'm uh, saying. Ida Rolf and um, Judith Aston and Ron Kurtz and Stanley Kellerman, they um, um, are in that somatic lineage. So Anna Halperin, so it's, that's what I'm referring to. Yes, yes. I wasn't a contradiction. There. I was just saying that they won't use that terminology. So it's it, like if you if you talk to a Rolfer, for example, they might not have even heard the word. But it's not to say that, I mean, I'd call those body-mind psychologies, mind-body, body, like, like it's, it's the difficult thing in this field that there's no, there's no agreed terminology out there. So everyone's just making it up. Uh, okay. So in, in terms of if someone finds themselves getting headaches, like, like what are some of the things they can do other than just take a paracetamol? Like what's some really use? let's make this really useful for people. What are some of the other really useful things they can do? Oh, uh, so Really, everything that I've talked about is a lot of it's preventative, um, working with diet, working with balanced diet, like what and when you eat, working with breathing, meditation, everything that I've mentioned really is is part of preventing. And then the self-massage can be part of relief and prevention. And then what I call the Mundo method, which is this hands-on headache therapy that works straight through the brain. So that's something that I teach people or that I do on them and I can teach it to them by um, phone, by video. Um, I teach it in my book, The Headache Healer's Handbook. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about it because for me, when you asked me at the beginning what caused me to Mm. stay in the field or be interested in the work, to me, that's some of the most fascinating part and I haven't seen the end of it yet. It's very connected to neuroscience and i'm really really curious how instead of using a medication that a touch protocol could stop pain and symptoms in in real time that could be going on for people for uh, hours a day a week months and years and so i wanted to talk some about what's so fascinating about that and it has to do with that your working with the headache or migraine almost like it's an entity like it's a thing even though it's not fixed so Mm -hmm. you don't work in a fixed spot so it's not like a headache has a a mass to it even though people can get headaches from situations that have masses but it's not like it's a disease like that it moves around and it it has um is connected to your nerves and your blood vessels and your neurohormones and by doing this touch therapy you're It's kind of like um, when you feel a headache or migraine on the head, it's like feeling mini explosions. And these mini explosions, that's what it feels like on the inside. You feel like your head is going to explode or it's pulsing and pounding. Well, you can feel and make contact with that on the outside of your head. And you can quiet that. And so, but it's different than putting your hands just on your temples or using compression on your temples because when you do that then usually the headache or migraine will come back so what it is it's it's like recycling the pulsing pounding and changing the flow of of something in the head i say it's the energy or probably a combination of energy and neurohormones and blood um everything that's pulsing and pounding shifts and you flatten it or still it in the front and then you and it's very subtle and in order to do that you also bring your mind right to the exact pinpoint of that pain so you're matching up the pain the pulsing of it that you're you as if you're working on yourself can feel on the inside to your touch which is feeling the pulsing and pounding from the outside and bringing your mind there too and then you're um, holding up your backhand 
180 degrees from that exact point that you're working on and you can feel it the pain or the sensations that were in the front, you can feel them release. And those sensations of the release are different than the sensations of the pain. They Sometimes people feel heat or uh, like a little energetic tingle in their hand or pressure, and you can feel that, and then you wait until that releases, and then the whole cycle where you were feeling all the symptoms that we've been talking about quiet down, and it's as if you never had it. So to me, that's the really fascinating part because it's like a headache or a migraine especially has a cycle of sensations and when the those and uh, that I've worked with thousands and thousands of times and then I can teach people how to do on themselves and when that cycle of sensations is complete then the headache is gone so it's a, a matter of teaching people the subtleties of how to work on those sensations and find them and and they'll shift around, move with them, refine them, and then also how to do what I call a mental push, which is like doing some kind of martial art or battle in the skies, but in that exact point of your pain where you are mentally uh, dominating the pain without in a relaxed body, without fighting it. So you're mentally becoming strong enough to fight it and overpower it. And um, I brought forth that mental component when I was told by a prominent neurologist to be careful that you didn't use too much pressure on the head. And that made me seriously really translate what I had been doing on the head and on the uh, and feeling in my hands and realize that I had been doing that mental push that I just described and that I needed to make that more dominant. So I did. And in fact, it's like doing a placebo, really, where you are using your mind and the power of your mind to produce, um, uh, and, and of your belief to produce uh, a change. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's kind not of entirely. I'm, I'm, like I'm going to be honest with you, I'm like... really tired because I just ate after four days of not eating, and all my blood's just gone to my stomach. And so I've been falling asleep a little bit, and do not take that personally. I'm just, uh, it, it's just uh, like this happens sometimes when you finish a fast. It's just, uh, I thought I'd eat something to energize myself for this call, and actually the opposite has happened. So apologies if I look a bit sleepy. Oh, no. Well, hopefully you'll listen back to it and find out what I just said is very profound. <laughs> you know what? I always listen back to the podcast because in the moment I'm more like in a different uh, flow, like a different job. So I was, I was listening to them back more as a sort of audience member and get a lot from it. I'm sure this is all in the Headache Healer's Handbook anyway, available from your website, which is theheadachecoach.com, right? Yes. Any other resources you want to recommend to people? Well, I mentioned Dr. Hutchinson's book. Um, um, I'm trying to women. I'm trying to figure out. If it, I think it's called Menopause and Migraine, or maybe it's Women mm -hmm. and Migraine. Or my, oh gosh, I'm forget, I should look in the back of my book. Sorry about that. Um, but I reference her in my book. Um, that's a really good book to read. And a bunch, a bunch of articles on your website here as well. Yes. Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> just look up Susan Hutchinson. I feel horrible. <laughs> okay, <laughs> not, nice dress. Not popping out at me. <laughs> no worries. Listen, we need to wrap this up. Do you have a kind of closing message about the body to finish? Believe it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, Jan, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me subscribe to get more and you can also leave us a review on itunes which helps with our rankings so really appreciate that um, equally if you want to support the podcast even more then fund us um, go to patreon give us a dollar per episode um, those who don't know patreon's a really good way of supporting things you want to see more of in the world I know like so much is available for free now and you know what I'd say is a lot of energy and effort goes into this podcast. Um, I put it out there for free so everyone can get it, you know, more than I work on this. Everyone that wants it can have it for free uh, and if you want to support us, it is really appreciated. So it's patreon.com slash Mark Walsh. And of course, if you want any in-person training, you can visit embodiedfacilitator.com. There's loads more resources there too. Till next time, welcome home to the body.